peace be with the Pacific Northwest all day today, God, even into tonight, God, and Sunday night football and the important things in life, God. Just be over them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Look at somebody and say, we're going to win. If you're a 49ers fan, keep your mouth closed. You know, Plumman, Plumman, y'all know Plumman running around here somewhere? He's a 49ers fan. Yeah, he and I, we're not on speaking terms right now. He asked me how I was doing this morning. I said, hmm. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Ah, you got your Bible with you this morning? How many got a Bible with them this morning? Open it up to Matthew chapter 13. Do me a favor. Give a big shout out to everybody watching on Facebook from all over the place. Right? Last Sunday of 2019. Last Sunday of the 2010s, teens. However you'd say that, right? Yeah. It's awesome. It's going to be great. It's going to be a good day. Lord's just been kind of stirring something in me and burning something in my heart for this message kind of as we're closing up this year and closing up this decade and then we're going to be together here New Year's Eve if you're tuning in New Year's Eve we're going to be here what time are we starting at 10 we're going from 10 to midnight 30 come on it'll be good been a lot of people have asked us to stream it um, on Facebook and so we might do that uh, just because I believe the Lord's going to speak prophetically over this house in this season we haven't done one of these type of services in uh um, 19 years. So uh, when we used to do them every New Year's Eve, uh, there was tremendous amount of prophetic word brought forth and uh, always, always a great time. So uh, I'm expecting that. Make it a point. You're going to love it. The alternative is sitting at home and watching something happen in New York that you really don't care about. Come here and invest in the house of God. Invest in your life. Invest in your community. Invest right here in Monroe and Snohomish County and wherever you live or lay your head. Invest in God's presence on New Year's Eve and watch an awakening occur in our midst, right? Come on now. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 through 9. This passage, I'm going to just kind of sum it up and call it the seed. Somebody say seed. He told many stories in the form of parables. Who told many stories in the form of parables? Jesus, right? Such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came in and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among the thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and then produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anytime Jesus would say the line, anyone who has ears to hear should listen and understand, might we think there's something deeper behind just the context of the story? Never dismiss the parable of the sower as just farm talk. There's a deeper principle behind the principle when it comes to the parable of the sower, right? What, what do we know about the parable of the sower? What do we know about seeds? Well, we know that in Galatians 6 verse 7, Paul says that whatever a man sows, He will also reap, right? And so when we, when we think about this, we know from Genesis that as long as there is seed time and harvest time, what do we know about the parable of the sower? We know that it is a divine order of things. It's not just farm talk. It's not just agriculture. It's not irrelevant because we live in the technology age. 
It's still relevant. Seed time and harvest time is happening all over God's creation in every season at all times. It's happening, and so it's relevant beyond just a story about times when people had to plant and harvest, plant and harvest, plant and harvest. And so if that's the case, then we should get serious about reaping a harvest. You, 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 we, we should begin to shift our mindsets to start thinking, God, what part of my life is seed right now? What part of my life is harvest right now? And we should think in that perspective because it's bigger and deeper than just seed taking root and growing into something. Don't give up on your seed is what I'm saying. What's the Bible say? Don't grow weary while what? Doing good. For in due season you'll what? You'll reap. If you don't lose heart, too many people losing heart in 2019 going into 2020 to reap what they've sown seed for. Don't leave your seed in the dirt somewhere in life. Recognize that you, you're going to come against, the, the, Jesus is like, you're gonna, some of it's going to be on the footpath. Some of it's going to be in the briar. Some of it's going to be, but some of it's going to be in good ground. Which part should you give up on? None of it. You don't give up on any aspect of your seed. What does Genesis tell us? Genesis basically says that he put man in the garden to keep it. So what does that tell us about what's growing around us? You're responsible for it. God put you. The garden represents your life. What you plant in your life grows into a harvest. Good seed grows into a harvest. Weeds grow into a harvest. Bad seed grows into a harvest. But what do we know about seed? What is the deeper meaning behind the parable of the sower? The deeper meaning is that it's your garden to tend. He gave it to you. It's your life to tend. So water the seed that you wish to harvest. What's it tell us? It says, be ready to put in the sickle. How many have used a sickle in the last 20 years? No, we call them weed whackers today, right? Like it's not a sickle, it's a mower, right? And preferably a John Deere riding mower, I guess, is like the popular one. But whatever, be ready to put the sickle to the harvest, right? The seed. Commanded to come forth. The seed. The seed. What, what you have sown. Some of you in this place, you've sown a tremendous amount of seed. Tremendous amount of seed. And I need to stop some of you because some of you are so churched that you automatically think seed. You think I, oh, we're ta- the preacher's talking about money when he's talking about seed. I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about serving. I'm talking about loving people. I'm talking about anything that you do out of the goodness of your own heart, out of the mandate, what you view as duty in Scripture, what your calling is, the part of you that gives, 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 gives in multiple directions, in multiple facets. Every part of that is seed. All of it's seed. So don't give up on seasons when you've planted seed in the area of serving, but you haven't immediately received the return that you thought you should in the time you thought you should. Don't, don't, don't grow weary doing that. The seed. Somebody say the seed. And then I'm going to flip to verse 18 and call it the soil. Verse 18 of Matthew 13 says, Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. The evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. 
The seed that fell on the good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. How many know the seed of the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, is planted in soil? How many know we are the soil? We are the footpath. We are the briar path. We are the shallow ground. We are the deep, fertile soil. We've been put in this garden to tend it. God created our life, and we are responsible to tend it. You can deal with briar patches, can't you? You can dig up fallow ground that have been traveled across by foot with a good old-fashioned spade, some shovel, and some sweat, right? Your seed, the seed of the word of God, your seed, your soil, who you are as the soil will produce the harvest upon your life. Now think about this in terms of all different things. Like, like, like when we're living this life, sometimes we come up on circumstances. And a lot of times we want to blame the enemy for our circumstances. But I think if, you're, if, you, if, you, if you recognize that you're the soil, you don't immediately blame the enemy. You immediately start asking, how am I tending to the soil of my own heart? If things are taking root in your own heart and seeds of, of disorder are being sown in your life, Seeds of wandering eyes are being sown in your life. Seeds of greed are being sown in your own life. You can't blame the devil for that. You are the gatekeeper of the garden that is your life, and the seed that you're capable of sowing will come from the harvest of the soil that you fertilize and make ready for what God wants to do. So think it in the terms of relationships. When your relationships get shaky, when they struggle, when they battle, instead of just blaming the devil for getting involved in your marriage and blaming her and blaming the kids and blaming there and blaming him and blaming, 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 you should look at the soil that you are for the seed of what's growing up out of it. Because if you're the kind of soil that produces sticker bushes, Lord knows in western Washington, you'll produce a lot of them. But if you're the soil that produces corn, the Lord knows you produce a lot of corn. Take care of your soil. Take care of it. Like good soil produces a 30, 60, 100 fold return. Somebody say the soil. I'm the soil. If you go through a season economically of leanness, you can't always just blame the devil. Sometimes you got to blame your spending habits. It's just like next month after Christmas, you know, 30 days from now, when Mr. Visa and Mr. MasterCard show up. I can't, like, blame the devil for why they read that. Right? Like, we have to look within if we're going to be good soil. We have to turn the soil. Relationally, we have to turn the soil. Finance. Sometimes sometimes the wisest things come our way in business, right? But what do we do? We know better. And we set a course away from wisdom, right? And we don't tend our soil. And the crazy thing is, it's like, here's the concept. Imagine, good soil is good soil, isn't it? So you can spend a long time developing good soil, plant one wrong seed in it, and get a massive harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold of the wrong kind of seed. Right? Right? This is why the Bible says wisdom takes a lifetime to gain and one moment to lose. Same with trust, right? Trust grows in good soil, grows strong in good soil, right? So 
So, so, so the soil. Listen. The easiest way to lose your seed is to step out of the realm of just owning your own garden. The easiest way to lose your seed is just to step into a life of sin. Like it doesn't even take any effort. Like things are leaning on you all the time to make choices that just don't, aren't going to be great for you, aren't going to be great for your relationships, probably not going to be great for your finances, probably don't. They probably lack wisdom. And it's the easiest way to lose the harvest and the seed. And the easiest way to get your soil just is just to just do that. And just not look within. I want to implore you as the days go by here, the next couple days, I want to implore you to get out some reflection paper. That's some paper that you're going to write some reflections on. And just ask, look back across this decade and say, my gosh, this is a real big high point in my life. Man, this is a spot where, man, if I could have a do-over, I'd do it over again. Reflect, be honest, get within and realize that like, man, you are in charge of the soil and good things grow in good soil. Bad things do too. They grow in good soil also. So guard the gate that surrounds your soil so that the seed, the word of God, is the seed, can be planted, and it can bring forth a mighty harvest, right? Right? When you lost, when you lose, when you, when you come to sometimes those grips in life, life, life where you feel like, man, I have lost the ability to produce a harvest, or I've lost the ability to produce a good harvest, or my soil isn't good, the easiest way I lose it sometimes is just with the When you find yourself in a season of loss, can I just encourage you to do one thing? Stop! Stop! Just call on the name of the Lord. The Bible calls it repentance. It's so easy. It's so easy to just turn to God and say, God, I, I made a mess of some stuff this year. I made a mess of some stuff this last decade, and forgive me, God. I repent, God. Lord, I'm coming to you to help, to ask you to help me to, like, turn the tide in this thing that I'm experiencing. See, sometimes in life we get fatalistic, and we think, well, you know, I'm this far down the path. I guess we might as well just drive her off the cliff. And the reality is, is, man, no, man, let's stop. Let's tend the soil so that he can plant the seed so that we can get a new harvest on the way. Because some of you deserve a new harvest in 2020. Some of you deserve a new harvest. Some of you are still reaping a harvest from the past, and you need to remember that Jesus Christ died. He paid the debt of your sin, and that harvest is dead, so stop watering it. Stop watering those negative words. Stop watering that perspective that steals from you. Stop watering those attitudes and those actions. Those things were exchanged. You don't have to pay for them with your guilt, with your shame, with your anything. You are totally and completely set free. Jesus is more than enough to make that exchange on your behalf. So allow a new seed to be planted, right? Take it back. First John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to what? Forgive. Right? Ask God to take back the surrendered ground. Reclaim what's rightfully yours. Your, your garden, your life is meant to produce good things. You, you are designed for good works. God created you in advance, he created the good works that you're going to do. So receive that promise and step into that. And put the brakes on anything that steals from the life that's within your soil. Within what God's word can produce in your life. Amen?
All right. Look at verse 24 through 30. We talked about the seed. We talked about the soil. Now let's talk about the enemy. Here's another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemies came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted the good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked? No, he replied. You'll uproot the weed if we do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. Let me tell you, the hardest way to lose your seed is an attack of the enemy. Because a lot of times, you won't even know that he messed in your world until the harvest starts coming out of the ground. When you have examined your life, when you're experiencing a harvest of some sort, maybe it's a Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's broken financially. Maybe it's broken in business, broken friendships. Whatever the case may be, when you own your soil and you examine your life and you go to God and you say, God, Lord, if there is anything in me that created this harvest, and you bring that and you deal with that, but a harvest still continues that you did not sow for. Somebody say, I didn't sow for this. You need to realize that's the enemy. See, a lot of people want to downplay the enemy because they don't want to get spiritual about their choices. We get to seed-stealing seasons and bad harvest seasons by our own choices. But this parable proves we also get there because the enemy comes and plants in our soil. And when the owner of the fields asks, like, who did it? The enemy clearly did it. Well, we, we could have this whole conversation. Well, maybe you should have put up a stronger fence. Keep the enemy out. That's an irrelevant conversation when the harvest is growing. So if you've dealt in a season where you're reaping some things that you didn't sow for, this is where you invoke <laughs> not who you are, but who he is. Because the promise is this. He's the Lord of the harvest, and he is going to bring that stuff to fruition in your life. But he is the one that owns the field and the wheat and the tares that are growing up in your field. He's going to cut the wheat down and the tares down and then let him separate which needs to be burned and which needs to be kept and put up in the barn. See, the easiest way to lose momentum in your life and to lose the harvest that you've been sowing for your whole life is just to make stupid choices. The toughest way to lose it is the enemy comes and literally unleashes an attack on you. Some of you have just been going along in life, minding your own business, and a diagnosis has blindsided you. That's the enemy. Some of you have just been going along in business and the economies of scale and the economies of change have swept in and they have just knocked you off of your pillars and you are a tipping stool. You like that pillars, four legs, stool, and more, yeah. And you're not sure, like, how you're going to get through it. That's the enemy. You can fight the enemy. When all of a sudden you've been walking this way, going this way, expecting this way, relationally, and then all of a sudden your mind is gone, and it's over here, and you're like, hold on a second. I did not sow this harvest into my field. I want you to know that's the enemy, and you need to start fighting the enemy how the enemy is fought. He's fought with the name of Jesus. He's fought with the blood of Christ. He's fought with the sword, amen, of the Spirit, the Word of God, and he's fought through prayer. 
That's how you fight him, amen? Ephesians 6, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. A lot of times your very thought that it's you that caused this is the flesh and blood that you're fighting. You're fighting yourself. When you should examine your heart, give it to God, repent of what's broken, ask for forgiveness, let the shame go, the guilt go, and then pick up the sword of the Spirit and start fighting on the terms that are not flesh and blood. And deal with the enemy in your house. Right? When your redemptive purpose is attacked by the enemy, when you have been marked and attacked unknowingly when people are attacking you, when knowingly the enemy is leveraging spiritual attack through people close to you, when you feel manipulated, when you're gossiped about, when lies are told about you, when slander, when, when constriction starts happening, anxiety starts elevating, days get darker, not brighter, depression's coming, and it starts to shut you down. I promise you, I don't think that's the harvest you were sowing 30, 60, and 100 fold for. That's the enemy. Start treating it like that. Start looking at it and start it using your weapons of your warfare to deal with it. Too many Christians suffer in harvest they didn't sow for because they just don't believe the enemy even really cares about them. Somebody told me a long time ago, the enemy is really just not that interested, Jeff, in whether you live or die. But what he is completely interested in is you getting your eyes off of what God has called you to sow in this lifetime. He'll get your eyes on every other responsibility. He'll get your eyes on every other relationship. He'll get your eyes over here and over here and over here. And he'll just keep you distracted. He doesn't need to take you out. He just needs you distracted so that you won't sow, you won't tend to your own field, you won't stay in your own garden, you won't bring forth the 30, 60, 100 fold return that God has designed for you to bring forth. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Somebody say, I didn't sow for this. Tear, tear down strongholds. Stop giving words to false ideas. Stop giving words to negative thoughts. Everything you think isn't the truth, and everything you think isn't like the spiritual angle. Stop giving words to those things. Words are like seeds. Words are like seeds. I had one of these nights about a week and a half ago. I was sitting on the couch. Mel could tell there was something wrong. She was looking at me. She was trying to love on me with her eyes and say nice things. And finally, I just went. Bleh, 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 bleh. And she got up and she went to the kitchen, not even saying anything. And I was just there kind of like, oh, great. She doesn't even have anything to say. She knows I'm right. Rah. And she comes back and she sits down and she just, in the nicest Pastor Melinda voice, she just says, you know, honey, I just think you shouldn't say any of those things anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, blah, 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 blah. and then she got up and went to bed. <laughs> I was out there. Because I'd said it, now I'm just, that's what, oh, oh yeah, I said it also. now, right, we vent, and then we don't think about it anymore. No, they're seeds. We vent, and we just planted seeds in soil that, I, I don't know about you, but I produce 30, 60, and 100 fold return. So like the good words I sow and the bad words I sow, they both grow. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, she's right. She's right. Now I have to go. I'm like Spiegel in Lord of the Rings. I'm, we're both. No, she's right. You know, I'm like talking out of both sides of my mouth. And so I just went in. I woke her up and I said, hey, I got to apologize for something. You didn't deserve to get vomited all over. And I'm sorry that I vomited all over and put all this sticky goo all over you. And if I could take every word back, I'd just take it back right now. And uh, good night, because it looks like you're sleeping. And I just left. <laughs> and I pulled those seeds out of the ground, and I threw them over the fence, 
Because not all the time do we control the seeds we plant. But you can control if they produce a harvest in your life. You can. Absolutely you can. Amen? Pull down strongholds. For our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So here's the deal. How do you move forward? Well, if you've created a season of no seed sowing, you're going to have to sow out of your lack. If you've harvested bitterness and anger and frustration and being disinterested, then you're going to have to start sowing different seeds out of your season where you're reaping a harvest of anger and bitterness and frustration. I'm telling you what, he's not going to treat you different after you've treated him this way for so long. You're going to have to start treating him different. You're going to have to sow better seed out of your harvest of pain. If you're in a season of financial lack because you haven't sowed any seed, you're going to have to sow out of lack. Sometimes we create deficits in our life, don't we? How do you turn that around? Well, Genesis says as long as there's seed time and harvest, it's going to work for us. Believers sow their way out of situations. I watched my mom and dad do this. When my mom and dad got saved, my dad had made some really, really poor choices. And um, it, was, it was really, really poor. And I watched my mom and dad sew. Every week they had an envelope where they would stick their tithe in the envelope, like right, like, like an envelope. Like Dave Ramsey did not invent the envelope system. My mom did. Like they'd put it in there and they'd take that thing to church and some weeks it would just clang with the sound of the change as they'd try to give their way to a different place. And I just used the financial as probably the easiest example for us to understand. When we go through seasons of lack, we have to sow out of our lack to step into a season of plenty. The same could be said for love. The same could be said for friendship. The same could be said in a marriage. You're not just all of a sudden going to have a honeymoon bliss all over again because you came to church the last Sunday of 2019 and heard Pastor Jeff speak about the, the sowing and the soil and the enemy. You're going to have to reclaim. You're going to have to take back that which rightfully belongs to you, but you're going to have to do it out of lack. But that's the powerful thing is that we know what does, God, what does God do with what we lack. He increases it. We come to him with the little bit and we say, God, here's my little bit. Right? And God says, well, here's my blessing on the little bit. And then comes forth the new. It's why the oil didn't run out. It's why the woman said, hey, you know what? I'll bake you a cake, but we're going to eat the, this was it for us. Me and my son, we're going to die. And the prophet said, no, you're not going to die. Bake me a cake first. And it never ran out. In fact, you study that out. She started like selling that stuff. It turned into a business for her in the middle of an economic crisis. Like, you got to just decide today, though, listen, I'm not going out of 2019 with the same mindset, the same attitude, the same lack, the same perspective, the same battle. I'm not going to keep sowing the same seed that keeps producing this nasty harvest in my life. I'm going to stop sowing the seed that produces the stuff in my life that I know doesn't reflect who I'm called to be. Make the choice. Because I'm telling you, it's a new season. The calendar's going to click. It is, this isn't about New Year's resolutions. This is about different harvest. I mean, if a farmer didn't get his field ready last year, he's going to work twice as hard at the beginning of this year to get his field ready. So what? We work out of lack when we haven't sown ahead. But lack still works 
when you start putting it in the ground. Because seed is seed, whether you got a jar of it or a dump truck load. Seed is seed. You want a dump truck load? Start sowing your way out of your life with the jar that you have. I don't even have a jar, Pastor Jeff. I got a handful. Then scatter that handful on the best ground you can find and start believing for it, start watering it, start praying over it, and start believing for an increase over your seed. Your relationships can bloom again. Your businesses can bloom again. Your, your, your finances can bloom again. Your life can bloom again. But you got to get on God's plan. There is seed time and there is harvest time. You cannot live your life relationally. Take, 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 take. You cannot live your life financially. Take, 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 take. Business. Take, 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 take. When you start sowing, you will start reaping and you start putting it in your barn and it'll just start stacking up and you'll be like oh my gosh we got plenty for us and you give even more and you plant even more that's how it works that's how those people that you look at and say my gosh they sure have a lot of friends that's how they got them no they were just you know they're just enneagram sevens and eights and you know leading from your strengths otters and oh, i'm just an introvert hogwash on all of that stuff i love personality stuff that's great but before personality stuff and before how you're wired is something called seed time and harvest and if you want friends the bible says be one and if you want a great marriage then sow one and if you want to be wealthy, then start investing in the kingdom of God. And if you want to build a business, then do it in the name of expanding the kingdom of God instead of just becoming rich and wealthy. I'm telling you, you shift your perspective at the end of this decade and next decade, you'll look back and say, my God, how did I even get here? And I'll tell you how you got there. You took the little bit that you had in the last of 2019 and you shifted your perspective and you got the crap out of your life that you've been tripping over your own self and you repented of it and you got the enemy out of your garden and you said, we're going to take this little bit and we're going to start working it. Working it. All right, stand up. We're done. Whew. Father, in Jesus' name. I feel like I'm only like halfway started, so that's the problem. When it's 1050, that's a problem. Father, I didn't really land this plane very graciously. God, we came in like, we came in fast and bounced it off the runway a couple times. So, thank you for the landing gear. Just real quickly, if you're in this place and you need to plant a different kind of seed, Holy Spirit knows. He's been waiting for you to know. Just tell him, just say, Lord, forgive me, God, for the seed I've been planting. Thank you, Jesus. I release now the guilt, the shame, bitterness. Drive out bitterness in Jesus' name. Drive it out in the name of Jesus. I want you to just put your hand right in front of you and look at it. I want you to just see it full of seed. Thank you, God. It might represent everything we taught. It might represent relationships. could represent your marriage. It might represent your business. could be your money. could be whatever it is. The life that God has, the good works that he's designed since the beginning of time for you to do, they are in that handful of seed. And I just want you to see, I want you, I want you to see yourself just planting it. Good soil in Jesus' name. Good soil. Father, as we close this year out, God, as we close this decade out, good soil. Good soil. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father.
to declare a season of increase. How many of you need a season of increase in your life? Just lift your hands up to heaven. Father, in Jesus' name, God, you supply seed to the sower. And so I thank you for miracle seed, God, coming into the hands of these people, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you for good soil. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name. All right, church. New Year's Eve. Is Sav back there? Are you closing up or am I closing up? I'm closing up. I've appointed myself. All right, we'll see you 10 o'clock Tuesday night. It's going to be an awesome time. Come ready to party. Also come ready to take this microphone and share one of the big things that God's done in your life recently because we're just going to have a time of testimony and sharing, and uh, we want to hear from everybody in the church that God's speaking to. Amen? All right, y'all. See you next weekend or Tuesday night. Go Seahawks.